first two research projects here, the CERN system was able to look at those stars over the amount of one year. The first involved three co-ordinated stars whose spectra, they were close enough that their spectra had not been previously disentangled, <coughs> making it difficult to determine their masses and ages. Uh, Elizabeth and her colleagues succeeded, but obtaining the exact data required courage because they had to obtain it from a facility having a menacing name, the Hard Labor Creek Observatory. <laughs> that was cool. The second project involved two co-ordinated stars, one of them still a real star and bright, and the other a stellar remnant uh, and very dead. And their goal was to detect the remnant that data uh, <coughs> said could be there. So the difficulty here was the analog of a star was the target, but the current activity of detecting an exoplanet in the glare of a single star. <coughs> Again, Elizabeth and her team succeeded, even though the pilot data came from the home. The third project at Georgia State was a DHT thesis, which compared the variations in the optical emission from an active supermassive black hole to the variations in its X-ray emission. Uh, ever since then, the Ferrari's researchers continue to focus on the emissions associated with supermassive black holes and also on the emissions from neutron stars and which pulsars. In 2001, she began working at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, which was soon involved in launching three separate missions, including the launch in 2008 of the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope, which has contributed really enormously to our understanding of the most energetic Fermi's primary instrument was its large area gamma ray telescope. And prior to Fermi's launch, Dr. Ferrara wrote and tested all of the procedures needed to command that telescope, which was the primary instrument of mission. That was a major contribution to the scientific community. Uh, in 2009, Dr. Ferrara moved to the University of Maryland, joining the Fermi Science Team at Goddard. In addition to her extensive scientific research with the Large Area Telescope on Fermi, she was also a member of the Fermi Black Collaboration, uh, and the Pulsar Research Consortium in Nanograd, which she was a part of the selection actor. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. It's funny, going and reading through all of those uh, things that I did when I was a, an undergrad and then a young grad student, um, I'd forgotten that I'd been so involved with binaries even from very, very early on. Uh, Hard Labor Creek Observatory uh, is the local observatory, much like this one, for Georgia State University, which is where I got my PhD. And I spent many, many, many nights there um, showing the public the skies, uh, teaching students, learning myself, and then... Um, Later on, uh, my PhD uh, data analysis and data acquisition was done at Lowell Observatory, which if you think it's cold here tonight, <laughs> I assure you, it was much colder in Arizona high on the plateau. So, uh, that being said, let me show you how I have been working on, still working on binaries, still working on st stellar remnants, and now moving into this new field of gravitational wave study. Uh, all right, so the title of my talk, most people don't just tell you the title of your talk, but this is what, this is, there's a reason, is using pulsar timing arrays to detect supermassive black hole mergers. There's a lot packed into that title, right? There's pulsar timing arrays, which means you're talking about pulsars. Whoops, you're back. Is this okay? Is that enough light? This is fine for me. Oh, okay, she said it's fine. Um, there are supermassive black holes, right, which is another kind of thing. There's merging supermassive black holes, and then there's detecting these things. So I'm going to try to talk through all of it. Hopefully I won't take, you too, take too long so that you can get outside and enjoy the night sky. I'm sure we have a lot of astronomers here. We have people who are enthusiasts. You probably all know what a pulsar is, but I'm going to briefly remind you that when a star is living its life, at the very end, it will explode, at least if it's a massive star. And what is left behind is this lovely supernova remnant that we like to look at in our telescopes. They're beautiful. But that is not the only piece that's left behind. Something else is left at the center. So that explosion
explosion explodes out, and the outer layers of the star are blown off. But the center of the star gets crushed down, and it leaves a stellar remnant. What kind of remnant that is depends on the mass of the star at the time it exploded. How big was it? If it was not very big at all, it actually really didn't explode, and you ended up with a white dwarf after all of the material, material has been blown up, blown off. Um, if it was very massive, the, the central core gets compressed down to the point where gravity itself can't hold it up, and it compresses down into, and it can't uh, fight against gravity, and it compresses down into a black hole. But if it's in this intermediate mass range, this, the leftover remnant is a neutron star. So the core that's left behind is between one and a half and two and a half times the mass of the sun. And the way these work is that this is low mass, but a large object. This is high mass, but a small object in radius diameter, whatever. And, and the neutron star kind of sits in the middle. So you now have this core at the center that's left behind. A, a neutron star will have a very strong magnetic field that magnetic field is frozen in from the time the star goes supernova. But the size is very, very small. It's about the size of a city. It could fit inside of the beltway. And so it's got a very strong gravitational field, a very strong magnetic field, and a lot of angular momentum. It's spinning very fast. That angular momentum from the full-size star has been compressed down into this very small object, much like a, an ice skater you know, gets faster as they spin and when they pull their arms in. At the, at the pole is a beam of radiation, a magnetic pole, that comes off and we see flashing from our point of view as it spins past our line of sight. That flashing, that pulsing, is why we call it a pulsar. Okay? Pulsars were discovered in 1967 by a young woman named Jocelyn Bell. She was working on her, uh, she was in graduate school working on her Ph.D., and uh, she was doing radio astronomy and found these little bits of unexpected fluff in her radio data when she went past a certain part of the sky. As part of that, looking deeper into that, she found very, very regular pulses right here that were the first indication of this, this astrophysical object with, <coughs> that we call a pulsar now. Of course, her advisor and his colleague, uh, Anthony Hewish, Martin Ryle, won the Nobel Prize for Physics in 1974. So we're discovered. <laughs> <laughs> we all understand. And in fact, she's, she is a, a Dame Jocelyn Bell is very, very, you know, equanimous about this. She says this is the way it worked. At the time, you're, if you are a graduate student, your study is being guided by your advisor. The advisor is actually doing the science. You're just being the labor. It's kind of how it Right? She has no problem with this. But everyone else, like me, you know, feels very frustrated. Yeah. Now, great, that's what a pulsar is. Let's talk about Fermi briefly. Fermi is the mission that I have been working on since uh, 2005, as you mentioned. I wrote all the scripts that turned on the large area telescope, which is this instrument right here. It's a big box on top. It's the one that I do all of my science with. There's a secondary instrument on the side, side called the Gamma Ray Burst Monitor. Those people who look at gamma ray bursts use that instrument. That's not what I look at. Um, the instrument, the Large Area Telescope, is an all-sky observer. It sees the entire sky every three hours. And it observes the highest energy form of light, which are these gamma rays. Now, because it sees the entire sky and it's looking at gamma rays, which are hard to detect, it, it basically is a photon-counting instrument. It is gradually building up a view of the sky over time. This is what that view looks like. This is actual Fermi data, 10 years of it. After, you know, if you add it all together and you look at the Fermi lab data, this is what it looks like. Along the middle here is the galactic plane, and then above and below the galactic plane, and actually inside of it as well, you see some point sources all over. So this is the, the Fermi data. That's what it looks like. What I do is I try to find sources in this data that I believe are pulsars. So pulsars have a very specific signature, and you can detect them pretty well using gamma ray spectroscopy. Fermi does gamma ray spectroscopy. 
So I spend a lot of time looking at things like this. This is a plot that shows active galaxies, AGN. These are black holes at the centers of other galaxies that have variability. So as material falls into the black hole, the black hole gets brighter, and then that material uh, gets used up, and, and the black hole gets dimmer. It also has pulsars. These are over here. Now, as you can see, the axes are source variability and spectral curvature. So this is a very curved source that doesn't vary much. It doesn't change brightness much. So these are our pulsars. The green sources in here are the sources that we consider unidentified. After you go through and you look at all of this data and you take the catalogs that you have and you say, okay, what kind of source we know produces gamma rays and is in that location? You do associations that way. Once you get rid of all of those, there's a whole bunch left over. Yes? Uh, what, what, what do you mean by spectral curvature? I'll show you in a second. So, once you finish that association, the ones that are left over are here in green. And you can see that when you have low, low spectral curvature and low variability, they all get mixed in, right? And I'll show you why. Here's an example of an unassociated, actually, no, this one is associated, but at the time when I think I was looking at this, this is an unassociated source from Fermi. Fermi doesn't get a lot of gamma rays, so you have to make pretty big bins in energy to get a spectrum. Okay? When we fit this, we actually fit individual photons. This is just representative. We actually fit the individual photons where they sit in the spectrum to see which spectrum fits better. In this case, a power law spectrum fit better. But you can see that if there were just a little bit more significant, if this were a little bit lower, or, oops, go back. All right, got to get there. If this one were a little bit lower, you could see that this would end up being a curved spectrum. And in fact, that is the signature of what is most likely a, pulse, a pulsar, a gamma ray pulsar. So I spend a lot of time looking at plots like this and seeing which of these points look like this. We'll see more in a minute. Once I've done that, I take a collection of points and I send it off to radio telescopes via the Pulsar Search Consortium, which is a global network of telescopes that search for, specifically for, new pulsars in Fermi data. Does anyone recognize some of these? Can you name them all? Arecibo. 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 Green Bank. Arecibo. Green Bank. Parks. Parks. Nonce. Westerbork. The GMRT in India. And Lofar. Where is Lofar? Lofar's in the Netherlands. Very low frequency. Goes down below 100 megahertz. These all have some certain things in common. One is that they have a large collecting area, which means that they can get a lot of, of, the, of the signal <coughs> in a very small amount of time. You need that because pulsars aren't necessarily all that bright. I'm not saying they're not smart. I'm just saying, you know. You need large sky coverage. You've got to be able to see a lot of the sky. Unfortunately, fixed, fixed um, observatories like Arecibo, and Nancé have a little bit of a disadvantage in this regard, but they have larger collecting areas, so they, they balance out. And then you need access to sub-gigahertz frequency bands. Most of the Fermi pulsars that we find are much, much brighter at frequencies below 500 megahertz. Many of these observatories don't, well, they don't have many, you know, receivers that go that low, but some of them do, and that's what gives us the, the best ability to take to detect Fermi pulsars. So how do you find Fermi pulsars? Like I said, you look at the, at the spectrum. Now, most of the bright gamma ray sources, when I'm looking at a, at a catalog, most of those bright gamma ray sources have been identified in previous gamma ray catalogs, and other people have gone to look at them, and they found out what those things are. So most of the time, what I'm looking at are sources that only have two or three points in the spectrum that are significant. Everything else is upper limits. Now, how on earth do you figure out which source is a pulsar with only two points? The answer is you look at which points. The Fermi sensitivity curve looks kind of like this. Okay? You can tell that. These are the upper limits. 
So when you have points that stick up in the middle above that sensitivity curve, what you're probably seeing, and, and, you, and this is an upper limit, right? That lowest point is an upper limit, and you have some points in the middle. What you're probably seeing is that curved spectrum of a pulsar. This is almost exactly what it looks like. Sticking up into the part of the, the instrument where it's sensitive, and it can finally detect that as something other than an upper limit. And so that is a very faint pulsar that's probably coming up. Now, is that always true? No. Honestly, the success rate is about one in five. But one in five is pretty good when you're talking about the entire sky. So you create a list of promising fair resources. You observe them with radio telescopes, preferably at low frequencies. That's where these tend to be brighter. And you search data, the data to find periodic signatures. Now, one might think, well, we didn't see them. Radios didn't see them before now, so maybe they're just faint. It's not really true. There's no evidence for a correlation and flux between gamma rays and radio. So the fact that these are coming out in gamma rays doesn't mean that they're going to be faint in radio. The reason that they haven't been detected is something we'll talk about. So there's no evidence for a flux correlation, but those radio telescopes have been pretty successful at finding Fermi pulsars in these gamma ray sources. And you can see the list of, of um, observatories. I understand there may be one coming from FAST, which is a new radio telescope in China. Uh, but the GPT, far and above, uh, succeeds more than anybody else. And the reason why is it has all three of those, those abilities, those special characteristics that I mentioned. It has large collecting area. It can see the entire sky, at least everything that's, in the, that's above a certain latitude. You can see most of the sky. And it has low frequency receivers, down to 350 megahertz. That's the sweet spot. So if we look, we're back in the Fermi data. These green tri uh, diamonds, that's what those are, are all of the gamma ray pulsars that have been detected in Fermi data. This is all of them. There's 234, I think, in this. That's pretty good. When we uh, when Fermi launched, there were about eight or nine, though. So there's been a huge revolution in what we know about gamma ray pulsars thanks to Fermi. So when we talk about pulsars, this is generally how they're characterized. You have your period versus your change in period. How much total energy is stored and how much energy is coming out. That's what those two numbers mean, those two uh, parameters mean. And what you can see is that there's a couple of different populations we're looking at here. The first population in the upper right-hand corner are called young pulsars. These are pulsars that after the explosion of their star, they start slowing down, right? they, st they start very fast, they have all of that angular momentum, and then over time, that angular momentum is slowly being given off in the form of radiation, that radiation that we see as radio pulses. The, the young pulsars that Fermi sees are divided into two types. The bright gamma ray sources, so they're bright in, in the gamma ray sky, and then we look at them and discover in the gamma rays that they're young energetic pulsars. That's one, those are the blue squares. And then the other population, the green square, green dots, are previously discovered pulsars, pulsars that were discovered in radio or x-ray or some other band, uh, that are also found later to be emitting in gamma rays. So we take the, the knowledge that we have from the radio or the x-ray, we apply that information about how the pulsar spins to the gamma ray data, and we find a pulsation. Those are the two types of young, uh, young pulsars that Fermi sees. Now, if you look at the Fermi data and say, where are the young pulsars? Here they are, mostly along the galactic plane. Now, why would that be? You're talking about massive stars that have gone supernova to create a pulsar. Where are massive stars? born in the galaxy. They don't live very long. Massive stars, the more massive it is, the shorter its lifespan. So they don't live very long, but they don't have time to go wandering off out of the disk of the galaxy. They end their life, they go supernova, they leave behind a pulsar, and they're still along the galactic plane. 
those that are kind of up high here are probably just closer. It's probably just a projection effect. Now, there are two groups here. The green ones, these are the ones that are visible in radio. And with the radio information, we can refine our gamma ray uh, understanding of them. The second kind are blue. These are the ones that are faint, or most of them are invisible in radio. There's also one right there, which was the first and only extragalactic gamma ray pulsar that's ever been detected. Uh, that's actually in the Large Magellanic Cloud. So there were 131 of those. If you look at which ones are gamma ray pulsars and unidentified Fermi sources, you find there's 54 of those. And 53, which is the only one, you can't find in the radio. They're just not there. So that means that the radio beam and the gamma ray emission region have to be in different geometric orientations. Right? They're literally sweeping different parts of the sky. Because if they were sweeping the same part of the sky, we'd see these in radio too. Right? Now there's some overlap because we just saw that there are some that are green that you can see in radio and gamma rays. But there's definitely a geometry where you can only see the gamma rays and not the radio. And we know that there's geometries where you can only see the radio and not the gamma rays. So there's a little bit of overlap, but you have different emission regions. Second part of the pulsar population that Fermi sees is this population down here. These are called recycled pulsars. There are three groups of recycled pulsars that Fermi sees. Radio-discovered millisecond pulsars that are found later to be gamma-ray pulsars. This is the equivalent of the green group that we were looking at before. You see them in radio, you look at the gamma-ray data and apply the knowledge that we have, and you see a pulsation. This is pretty easy, pretty straightforward. The second group, this is supposed to be orange, it's a little hard to see, uh, are new radio millisecond pulsars that are found in Fermi sources. These are the ones that I send lists off for. So I make a list, I send them off to the radio telescopes, or I use my own list sometimes, and um, you search in radio and you find a new, so a new radio pulsar. And then when you apply that information, the radio information is easier to acquire if you can detect it. You apply that information to the gamma rays and you find a pulsation. Those are the orange ones. And then there's a third population here that there's only a few. These are millisecond pulsars that are found using blind searches. This is the equivalent of the blue population that we were talking about, about before. They are faint or invisible in radio. So here's the Fermi data again. This time we, I put up all of the positions of the recycled pulsars. There's 103 of those known at the moment. The red ones are the ones that had been discovered in radio surveys, and then we later found out they were gamma ray pulsars. The orange ones are the ones that were found using these Fermi positions where we went off and we looked with radio telescopes. There's also three. Oops. So these are the, the ones that we're using unidentified sources, the sources that I was looking at. And here's the three that are not seen in radio. Now that's interesting because, if you'll recall, the young radio pulsars, about half of them were not seen in radio. But here you have only three out of 103 that aren't seen in radio. What does that tell us? It tells us that the emission regions for the millisecond pulsars are much more overlapped between radio and gamma rays than they were for the young pulsars. It's just a geometric effect. Okay? Fair enough. So, about half of the millisecond pulsars that we see in gamma rays were previously known from radial surveys. Most of those new MSPs that have been found with, from the Fermi were in dedicated radio follow-up observations. So then the question is, why did they not see the other 50% in the radio surveys. The answer to that has to do with how recycled pulsars are formed. <coughs> when you form a millisecond pulsar, this is the process that it goes through. The mass ratio between these doesn't matter that much. But you have two different mass stars. The heavier star, the more massive star, is the one that will go supernova first. It explodes and creates a pulsar. This is a young pulsar in a binary. It's in a binary system. Over 
over time, the companion to that pulsar will go into its giant phase. It will evolve. And during that same period of time, this pulsar is gradually going to slow down, less and less energetic. But as this goes into its giant phase, it will overflow its Roche lobe, and you will end up with mass transfer. So it gets big enough that it can't keep the matter, its, its photosphere on the star, <coughs> ends up having to funnel it through to the other body in the system that has gravitation. It fills the Roche lobe, spirals through, and it creates a low-mass X-ray binary, an accreting neutron star that has material flowing onto it and is shining brightly in X-rays from the corona of this accretion disk. Finally, this star will give up all it has. Now, during this process, it's transferring angular momentum to the neutron star. It's dumping its angular momentum over time from the star to the neutron star. And that neutron star, even though you can't see radio pulsations because they're being quenched by the accretion disk, is getting faster and faster and faster. And at some point, the pulsations will turn back on. It'll turn back on. It goes faster and faster until it gets to the point where the periods, instead of being periods of about a second or a tenth of a second, like this pulsar, get to the point where they're hundreds of times a second. The fastest known millisecond pulsar, I believe, is 736 rotations per second. So that's about twice as fast as your kitchen blender. Really fast. The size of the city rotating twice as fast as your kitchen blender. And this, this companion star no longer has any material to dump. It's gotten down to the core. In the process of this, they also the, the orbit gets smaller and smaller and smaller. It's all part of how it works. And so this is now close to the neutron star. It no longer has material. You're basically, I have a stripped white dwarf at the end of it. And this pulsar wind can start ablating, blowing away the material that makes up its companion. Eventually, possibly, it may become isolated that, that way. It may end up completely evaporating its companion. Now, there's some skeptics about the physics of that. Some people say that would take longer than the universe that we know of so far, longer than our, our Hubble time. Um, but, of course, you can also become isolated through interactions, right? If they get too close to something else, it could knock the, the binary apart, and you end up with an isolated millisecond pulsar. We know isolated millisecond pulsars exist. We see them. So, that's recycling. Now, one of the reasons why we did not see these gamma-ray millisecond pulsars in the radio surveys, there are several. One is that the radio surveys are kind of shallow, so they don't necessarily go deep enough. But the other is that 80% of these millisecond pulsars are in binary systems. And when you have a binary, you have acceleration, meaning you're, you're searching for a periodic signal, but that periodic signal now has a Doppler shift as it goes around its companion. And so that signal is shifting just a little bit in frequency as you're searching for it. And so it gets harder and harder, depending on how close that binary is, to actually detect the millisecond pulses in the, the radio data. So this is why, one of the main reasons, they did not find these millisecond pulsars in the radio searches. The other is that, remember I was saying that there was this binary and it's blowing material off of its companion? That material scatters radio pulses. It doesn't scatter gamma rays. Gamma rays can go right through it. But at the radio frequencies, it can cause, it can actually you know, disrupt the radio signal that's coming from this millisecond <coughs> pulsar. So that's another reason that they were harder to find. Several of these we've looked at for hundreds of hours in radio and only see, you know, maybe a thousand seconds of pulses, maybe not even. So they, they're very hard to detect. But that means that we're looking at an interesting population, one that can tell us about, about stellar evolution and you know, binary ev evolution, things like that. So keep that in your head, and let's move on to the next topic. Gravitational waves. <clears throat> Gravitational waves are the warping of space-time caused by two massive objects orbiting each other. Fundamentally, all they are, right? So to get gravitational waves, you need two massive objects that are orbiting each other. It, the masses are pulling on space-time, and they're 
the direction of that pole is this spiral shape. Okay? Something like that. Now, it's hard to conceive of gravitational waves because we're talking about the altering of three-dimensional space-time. It's a little tough. Most of the time we think about gravitational waves as ripples in a pond. But that's not really what's happening, right? The, the gravitational wave is not acting like a ripple. Rather, it's acting more like a worm. It's stretching and squeezing space-time itself as it propagates along. And so what you get is this three-dimensional distortion of space-time as a gravitational wave passes by. Now, what kind of sources produce gravitational wave? Well, I just told you. Massive sources that orbit each other. At the high mass end, we can have binary supermassive black holes. So supermassive black holes are black holes at the centers of galaxies that have been gradually collecting mass over the entire history of the universe. If you happen to have two of them and they're close to each other, you can get gravitational waves. You can have high mass, uh, high mass binary stars, X-ray binaries, gamma ray binaries, whatever. You have a large mass here, you have a large mass in, in your remnant. If they're close enough together, they can produce gravitational waves. Well, actually, they're always producing gravitational waves, but that may not be the dominant effect that you're seeing when you're watching a uh, high-mass binary star. Binary black holes. So it's the analog to this, but these are stellar-sized instead of galaxy-sized. And then binary neutron stars. We know we've seen these. These were detected uh, 2017, August 2017. Uh, was the first merging binary neutron star that was detected by LIGO. So LIGO has detected both of these. Now when you put these all together, what you get is essentially a spectrum for gravitational waves. This is much like the, the analog to the electromagnetic spectrum, but for di different kind of physics, right? You have high mass with longer periods and larger separations, but because they're so high mass, they can produce gravitational waves that we hope to detect. And go th going this direction, you end up with lower mass, shorter periods, and smaller separations. It's just basically a, you know, a sequence. And it's been envisioned like this. The reason these have long purple bars is because the frequency, which is what we're going to see in a second, changes over time. So they have a range of frequencies that you can see them in. So this is the electromagnet, oh, no, sorry, the gravitational wave spectrum as seen by NASA. It has uh, on the massive end supermassive black hole binaries with periods of years. On the low mass end, you have um, I think this is basically oops, that was not supposed to happen. So we have I said stop. Thank you. Okay. So we have things like gamma ray bursts that produce gravitational waves. You have pulsars. That, when it says pulsars here, it's talking about a pulsar that may have a, uh, a neutral star that may have, like, a mountain on the side, which is about this big. And that asymmetry could cause gravitational waves. These are all things that could possibly cause gravitational waves. But you'll notice that the time scale goes from seconds to years. And the way these are detected is different for the different kinds of objects. On this end, where you're talking about millisecond periods, or millisecond wave periods, um, you can use terrestrial interferometers, things that have arms of five kilometers, to detect them. But at a certain point, your, your periods are too long for the light travel time along the arm to be enough to give you the signal that you need to detect gravitational waves. So you have to get longer arms. To do that, you can go to space-based interferometers. The LISA mission that the, e that the European Space Agency, along with NASA, are putting together uh, is scheduled to launch in 2035. I'm part of that mission. Uh, that will have two and a half million kilometer arms connected only through a laser, just spacecraft flying separately. Um, and the hope there is to detect gravitational waves from these sorts of objects, compact binary and spirals. That's going to be like the neutron star binary that was detected by LIGO, catching it before it ends up in the LIGO band, earlier on. See, it can move this direction. Um, extreme mass ratio in spirals, that's a black hole with something small, like a white dwarf. Um, yeah, so those are the kinds of things it's looking for. But once you get to a certain point, which is about this cutoff, you can't use space-based interferometers. You can't get the arms long enough. You've got to get bigger than the solar system. And that's going to be tough 
for man-made anything, right? How long is it? How long has Pioneer Ten been out there? Take a while. So you have to find some other way to do that, and that's where radio pulsar timing arrays come in. Pulsar timing arrays, also known as PTAs, are how we want, to, how we believe we will be able to detect supermassive black hole binaries. Now, we won't be able to see the merger. That merger actually happens in the LISA band, but it takes a really long time to get to a merger, so that's probably okay. Uh, if we can just detect the supermassive black hole binaries, that would be really nice. So, the difference in these three different kinds of technologies is simply arm length. All we're talking about. You've got short arms here on order of one kilometer when you're talking about, you know, order of magnitudes. Here it's 10 to the 6 kilometers. Here we're talking 10 to the 16th kilometers because we're using pulsars as our instrument. So how do we do that? Well, we'll talk about that in a minute. Let's just briefly talk about frequency evolution. The frequency of the gravitational wave that you are detecting will change with time for the source. And for PTAs, that black hole... The binary supermassive black hole, that's what that means, uh, will slowly end spiral, and that will change the frequency of the gravitational wave. As I said before, the, the end spiral will start in the PTA band. Over time, it will get to the LISA band. Those mergers are in the LISA band. The ones that they see, when they see them, will not be the same supermassive black holes that the PTAs are looking at, because this time constant is just too long. We won't see them in like, that, that won't be a short period of time. You're talking, you know, millions of years. Well, hundreds of thousands of years. Depends. We're not sure. But it's certainly not going to be short. So what are pulsar timing arrays doing? A pulsar has a beam coming from its magnetic pole. It's sweeping past the Earth. Every time it sweeps past, we see a pulse of emission. Basic pulsar. And... In a perfect world, in a perfect universe, we would know exactly when those pulses are arriving. They would arrive very regularly with no shifts at all, and we would be happy. We have a perfect pulsar. If you have gravitational waves on top of a perfect pulsar, it shifts the pulse arrival times by small amounts. And if you know the frequency of your pulsar perfectly, and you know the frequency of your gravitational waves perfectly, and you know the direction that the gravitational waves are coming from, you can predict exactly what those shifts will be. It's just physics. It's just math. Unfortunately, we don't know any of those three things as precisely <laughs> as we'd like. And some of them we don't know at all. In fact, only one of them do we know. We know pretty well what we think the pulsar period is. And that's because over time, these shifts are going to average out. And you can measure it. You can measure this precise period pretty well. But for the other two, the location of the supermassive black hole binary that you're looking at and the, the frequency of the gravitational waves, eh, we don't know. We don't know where they are. We don't know which ones they are. So, okay, so how are you going to find them? So we measure, pulsar time arrays measure the minute shifts caused by the gravitational waves. To do that, they need very precise clocks. Millisecond pulsars are the most precise and stable natural clocks in the universe. So we're talking about the types of pulsars that Fermi can detect. Remember, 80% of them are binaries. Pulsar time arrays use MSPs because they are nature's most precise and stable natural clocks. They don't use young pulsars. They are too noisy. It turns out that after a neutron star has been formed by this big, massive explosion and collapse and, and compression, there are actually, there's a lot of instabilities in the crust of a, of a neutron star. It takes a long time to settle down, longer than it does to spin down. So the only, time, only neutron stars that have gotten stable enough to use for this kind of precise timing are the ones that have gone through recycling, because it takes a long time to do that as well. So... These millisecond pulsars, the recycled pulsars, are much more stable and are usable for pulsar timing arrays. In addition, close binary systems have too much intrinsic noise to be used for gravitational wave detection. So, those, those 
those fantastic millisecond pulsars that Fermi is finding, 80% of them are in binaries. That means that we can only use 20% for, for pulsar timing arrays for gravitational waves. But that's okay, 20% is more than we had. So that's good. Right? So when gravitational waves are, are being looked at, they affect the pulsar timing that we're de detecting from these pulsars in two different ways. The first one is the pulsar term. A gravitational wave is passing the pulsar and shifting the, the emission time really the distance. It's really the distance that it's shifting. It's changing the distance between the Earth and the pulsar ever so slightly. And that distance shift is what changes the arrival time, right? Because it's having to travel a little bit farther or a little bit less. And so that shifts the arrival time of the pulsars. But that's different for different pulsars because they're all at different distances. Make sense? Then there's the Earth term. The Earth also has, assuming the presence of gravitational waves, the Earth also has gravitational waves passing and warping it. And that Earth term is going to be the same for all the pulsars, regardless of distance, regardless of direction. The time of the gravitational wave passing the Earth is going to be the same. That's the signal that pulsar timing arrays are looking for. They're using these to find that. The shifting, squeezing of the Earth caused by gravitational waves passing the Earth from supermassive black hole binary. So they have periods of years. So we're looking for that shift over periods of years. Okay, that's pulsar timing. Now this shift is, if you see it in all the pulsars, what the, the jargon is for pulsar timing rate folks is a common red noise process. It's a red noise that we see in the residuals, the timing residuals of all of the pulsars that we're observing. Okay. The first millisecond pulsar was discovered in 1982. In 1983, some go-getters were already calculating how what the signal would look like if you had millisecond pulsars spread across the sky and were looking for a gravitational wave signal. That's pretty good to be on top of it that fast. Hellings and Downs uh, published this in 1983, and they said if you have pulsars a whole suite of them, with different angular separations. How much power would you get from a passing gravitational wave? Actually, this is for a suite. This is for the stochastic background. Imagine you have pulsars all over the sky that you're looking at, and binary supermassive black holes all over the sky that you are trying to measure gravitational waves from. What is that going to look like in your detector? And the answer is this. Based on the angular separation, you get a correlation coefficient that follows this line. Okay? So at zero separation, or very close together pulsars, the effect on the timing is going to be very large. At, what is that, 70, no, sorry, 50 degrees, it's basically nil. At 120 degrees, again, basically nil. And then again, at 180 degrees, you start to see p power. So, Opposite the sky, same side of the sky, or in a negative correlation at 90 degrees to each other. And that makes sense. This, you're, you're squeezing and shift and stretching, right? So if they're on opposite sides of the sky, they'd stretch in the same direction, and the squeeze comes 90 degrees to that, right? So 90 degrees away, you'll be getting pushed. So you get your biggest power this way or this way. And one way it's a positive correlation, and one way it's a negative correlation. And it makes sense. So the goal of a pulsar timing array is to say, this is what we're looking for. We need to populate this curve with a different angular separations. So we need lots of pulsars all around the sky to be able to, to detect this signal. So you have to look in all directions if you want to be able to detect this. There's the areas that I was talking about. These are the places on the Hellings and Down curve that give you the most power. In this, whoops, in that range, okay, you saw it. Anyway, this is what we're doing. So here's the sun. That's the international symbol for the sun, right? And in all different directions in our galaxy, we have pulsars that we're looking at. All different directions. And the nice thing about millisecond pulsars is they have been around for a long time. So remember I said that the, that the 
gun pulsars were concentrating on the plane. Well, the second pulsars have had, have had time to drift off. And so they aren't just in the plane of the galaxy. You can get three-dimensional instead of just a plane of, of pulsars. That's good. We like that. So this now, these, these are the various pulsars at the end. This now becomes our detector. We've taken the galaxy, or at least our local area of the galaxy, and we've turned it into a gravitational wave detector with many different arms. The arm is from here to here, or from here to here, or from here to there. Lots of different baselines, lots of different arms that we can use. Unfortunately, we don't have high-frequency data. Yes, they're millisecond pulsars, but you still only have the period of the pulse, right? You can't use, like, what LIGO is using, which is looking at waves using using electromagnetic uh, photons as waves instead and being able to get diffraction patterns. There's not enough throughput here. But we have a lot of arms. So a lot of baselines helps us out that way. And so then as that gravitational wave passes through the galaxy, you'll get correlated, we hope, shifts in the pulsar timing from all of the various pulsars due to the Earth term as it travels across the gravitational wave passing through. So to do that, we have to observe lots and lots of MSPs. <clears throat> right now, there are three formal pulsar timing arrays globally. Each of them have different methodologies. There's the European pulsar timing array. They're all named so creatively. There's the P Parks pulsar timing array. That uses the Parks telescope. And then there's Nanograph. That's the North American Nanohertz Observatory for Gravitational Waves. It's a mouthful. Why is it called Nanograph? Why is it Nanohertz Observatory? Because Nanohertz is the frequency at which we would be detecting supermassive black hole binaries via gravitational waves. And together, these guys have kind of joined up and produced a, a group. It's a loose affiliation called the International Pulsar Timing Array. What ha tends to happen is each group will take their data, they'll analyze it separately, they'll put out their papers, and then they dump the data into the International Pulsar Timing Array, and then people can use it as a suite, but you know they get their, their stuff out first, which is perfectly reasonable. It's, they put a lot of time into it. They should. But they do have data sharing. Uh, they share other information about their methodologies and things that are working and things that aren't. Uh, there are also future contributions probably coming from FAST, cer certainly coming from the SKA in South Africa when that gets online. Um, yeah, so that's where you get the data for the pulsar timing. Here's a, a visual of all of the telescopes in the world that are being used for pulsar timing arrays. The SKA is not yet really online, but it's coming. Of course, the first thing you'll rec recognize here is the asymmetry, right? Everybody sees it? Right? The equators are not in the middle. In addition, there's a lot more ma land mass in the north, and so you tend to have more telescopes up there. It means that there's a little bit of a dearth of, of southern hemisphere data. If you don't have telescopes, you can't take observations of millisecond pulsars. Now remember, to get that Hellings and Downs curve filled out, you need to have pulsars all over the sky. If you don't have enough in the south, you're going to miss out. So SKA is good, really going to help when it comes online. It'll be very sensitive, and it'll be uh, it'll be very useful. The other thing to remember about these, like I said, the, the different pulsar timing arrays use different methodologies. So that means that there are really three different experiments that are happening here. The uh, European pulsar timing array uses five different telescopes. It has 42 pulsars that it monitors, <clears throat> but it mostly monitors them only at L-band. We're going to talk about why that might not be the best methodology, but it's what they do because their, their focus is on well-timed MSPs. The Pulse, Parks Pulsar Timing Array uses the Parks Radio Telescope exclusively, so it only has one telescope. Again, that might not be the best way to do it, but that's how they do it. They have 24 pulsars that they monitor, and their observations started in 2004. And then Nanograph uses two telescopes, Arecibo and Green Bank, Although it will be joining a CHIME, which is a, a pulsar observing telescope in uh, British Columbia, will be joining soon. It's currently monitoring 68 pulsars, so they, we went for um, bigger is better. Uh, observation started in 20, uh, 2005, and that large MSP suite 
it has multi-frequency observations with both sparse and dense sampling. So we get different kinds of sampling of the effects that I'm going to talk about next. Well, not next, in a moment. Okay, so could, could we just yep. back up a little bit? Sure. Are we looking at one gravitational wave at a time? So no. But what Hellings and Downs uh, started with, and what we believe is going to happen, is that there are supermassive black holes, binary supermassive black holes, all around the sky. They're all putting out gravitational waves. And what we will see is the superposition of all of these waves as they're arriving at the Earth. That's called the stochastic gravitational wave background. So each pulsar is being affected by this whole suite of gravitational waves. And the Earth, yes. And the Earth is affected by... The whole suite. The whole suite. Yes. And can we assume that certain gravitational waves will be stronger than others so that yes. perhaps we can pick out the, the and that's more what's, strong ones to analyze? That's okay. what's going to happen is if we get, when we get this detection, I'm not going to say if, I'm sure we're going to get it. Uh, when we get this detection, the, what will happen is we'll start building up. First, we'll, know, we'll see that the background or the, the limits stop dropping, which means that we've hit the background level. And then over time, we'll start to see signals pop out. It's kind of, it reminds me a lot of doing the microwave background kinds of measurements, where as you, as you get better and better, you get more and more um, finer grain, grains of, of what you're seeing on the sky. But you can see the large scale from even the, the earlier experiments, right? You just get, you get more and more information over time. I'll show you, a, I'll show you an example of that in a moment. Pulsar is affected by the, the gravitational wave at its location. Yes. To me, it seems that it's just the frequency of the gravitational wave that matters. The direction doesn't really enter. Yeah, it does, because it, it, it affects the pattern because of the, the kind of signal it is. It's a quadrupole signal. I'll show you some simulations okay. when we get closer to the end. All right, so, so then the question is, okay, first... Do we really think there's supermassive black hole binaries out there? These are beautiful Hubble images that I have adulterated with these big black dots to show that here we have merging galaxies. We see galaxies merging. We know they merge. We see it happening, right? These beautiful, beautiful pictures. And if, as we assume, most galaxies contain central supermassive black holes, some of these are going to end up with supermassive black hole binaries. I mean, it's possible that one gets kicked out in every single circumstance, but that doesn't really seem to make sense. So some fraction of these galaxy mergers must produce binary supermassive black holes. It just it seems like it should be. If we think about the history of the universe, in the early universe you had small galaxies, you had seed black holes that some of them might have made supermassive black holes early on. As these galaxies merged, that supermassive black hole gets carried along until another seed galaxy that has a supermassive black hole at the center joins it. You end up with a binary. Eventually those merge. This is just kind of the concept of how galaxies have built up supermassive black holes in their center over time. It's pretty well agreed upon, although I can't necessarily say there's a huge amount of evidence. That's exactly what we're looking for. Um, from the early universe to the current universe. <clears throat> so some percentage of those merged galaxies should have non-merged central black holes. The question is, what percent is it? The answer is, we don't know. That's, that's really the fundamental question for us. And how you get from a, you know, two black holes in two different galaxies to two black holes that have been, are almost to the point of merging, how long does that take? We don't know. Are those binary systems close enough together to be detectable? Do they ever merge? It may be that they get to a certain point and then they just can't, they can't drive themselves any closer. It takes too long. Again, larger than a Hubble time. But then you would think, because we see these galaxies that have had more than one merger, that we start to see triple systems. You know, big, you know, well, there's super circumstantial evidence that supermassive black holes in binaries do exist. There's a system called OJ287. This is an active galaxy. And it has a periodicity in the optical of about 12 years, 
what they, we believe is that there is <clears throat> an intermediate black hole that is orbiting the supermassive black hole at the center uh, on an elliptical and inc inclined orbit. And that every time it goes through this accretion disk at the center of the galaxy, it disturbs the material, kicks it up, throws it into the jet, and we see an outburst of activity. And that that's what's causing this periodicity in the light curve. We also see a periodicity in this particular galaxy, PG 1553, in gamma rays, that appears to have a cyclic nature of about every three and a half years. That's one that could have a supermassive black hole binary at the center. Could be something similar to this that's causing it. And then we see galaxies like 3C186. This is the galaxy. The center of the galaxy is right there. But this is the AGN. So what's happened here measured the velocity with respect to the rest frame of the stars. And that's, that, that thing's booking it out of the galaxy like nobody's <coughs> business. That supermassive black hole is running away. The only way you can do that is to have an interaction with another supermassive black hole, something else as massive, to get that thing kicked out. So it's likely that that galaxy had two black holes in it, and it kicked one out. Does it have three? Maybe. I don't know. But there's circumstantial evidence for it. This is what I was talking about. So what will gravitational waves from supermassive black hole binaries, I should have put binaries up there, look like? If you take two supermassive black hole binaries and you stick them on the sky in two places, we've got one here and we've got one there, they create an antenna pattern for a quadrupole. That's the, that Hellings and Downs curve is what tells you that you have a quadrupole signature. Which means that, and, and in fact, the way that, that gravitational waves stretch and squeeze, quadrupole. We understand this. How intense the signal will be depends on the, the uh, geometric configuration of the system. If the system is face on, you get more intense gravitational waves, amplitude. If the, the system is edge on, that amplitude is much lessened. It's not zero, but it's much lessened. <clears throat> so that's a signature for two sources, but that's not what we expect to see. We expect to see this stochastic background of lots of points from all different areas of the sky. If you put this all together, and you simulate it, and you say, what are we going to see? You end up with something that looks kind of like this. And if you look at the power and the phase, what you realize is, even though you have a superposition of lots of different sources causing this modeled effect, oops, go back. There we are. Uh, even though you have this superposition causing a modeled effect, the strongest sources are the ones that show up. You still can pull those strong quadrupole signatures. There's one, two, three. Those are the brightest ones. Out of the data that allow you to say, okay, we know there's a system there. We know there's a system there. You, you know there's a system there. Then you take that signal out. You model out that signal. You look at the residuals, and you wait for the next one to show up. And so over time, as we add up this data, as we... You know, continue to build on the data set. You'll find a signal that you can detect as a single foot source. You'll subtract it off, and then you'll look at what's left until you find the next source. And you'll subtract it off until you look at what's next and you find the next source. And, and, and until you get all those sources, and then you're just waiting for more sources to come out of the background. Does that make sense? That's essentially how it's going to work. And in fact, Lisa is going to use exactly the same method. So this, will or, this is already, you know, this is being tested. This, this code is being tested with the, with the pulsar timing arrays and will be used exactly the same way by LISA once LISA is launched in 2034. So that's what we're looking for. What have we seen? We've taken a lot of data. This is the 11-year data set from Nanogram. It's the 60, I think this is 63 pulsars. We're at 68 now, but I don't think all of them got into the 11-year data set. And what you're seeing is every dot that is up here is an individual measurement by an observatory. The different colors are different frequencies. Uh, for GBT, green is 800 megahertz. Blue is 1400 L-band. For Arecibo, 
The gold ones are 430 megahertz, and the blue ones are L-band. Uh, there's some of these purples are S-band, so 2100 megahertz, 2 megahertz. <clears throat> and then there's some low-frequency uh, Arecibo 327 down here in red. You'll notice that we're taking, if you look at it, we're trying to take two different frequencies at every given epoch. And the reason we do that is because it tells us information about the material that the pulse is passing through between the pulsar and us. So that's a lot of data right there. But you'll also notice it's pretty sparse at the beginning. That's because they didn't have many good pulsars early on. It's as new pulsars are discovered and good ones are found, they get added to the array. I came in about here and started digging up new ones. You can see that now there's a lot more. So, uh, yeah, so that's the data. And here's that Hollington down curve again. If we populate the angular separation, let's see how many pulsars do we have at each of these given separations. This is what you get. These are the angular separations between pairs of pulsars, so between this one and this one, this one and that one, this one and that one, you just work your way down. And how many times it goes into that bin, you see it around 42, 45 degrees, there's something like, you know, 77 pairs that give you something like a 45 degree difference. But if you look at those areas that I said give you the most power, remember over here and over here? You can really look over there, but that's probably some pretty good stuff. Um, yeah, that's where we have our, our dirt, right? And part of that, this one is simply because you don't have a lot of sky, right? In fact, a lot of that is, is geometric effects. You don't have a lot of sky that's going to be exactly next to the pulsar that you have. You have to get a little farther away before you're going to find something, have enough you know, steradians, enough solid angle to be able to find another source. There's that. And then you have the same problem here, but you also have that opposite effect of not having southern hemisphere observations. Nanograv only works in the northern hemisphere, Arecibo and Green Bank. So we lose out on anything below about 45 degrees, negative 45 degrees in declination. We can't look at it. So now we want to time the pulsars. We know we have them, we're taking data on them, but we've got to get the timing of that arrival of the pulse. Um, to do that, this is what a pulse looks like when it arrives. It is dispersed. This is using uh, frequencies around 300 megahertz. The, the pulse arrival time comes later and later as you go to lower and lower frequency. That's caused by the, the pulse, the radio pulse, traveling through the interstellar medium and being delayed. The higher the frequency, the less it's affected by the column of, of material that it's traveling through, the neutral hydrogen that it's traveling through. To get this pulse, we have to correct for that. And this is called dispersion measure. We can measure this curve, we can figure out what that value is, and straighten it up and give us that pulse. Now that the dispersion is what we're, one thing we're correcting for. Pulse broadening also changes with frequency. As you get to lower frequency, that, that dispersion I was talking about also takes the pulse and makes it wider. And it actually makes it wider in a particular way. We can correct a lot of that too. And then there's pulse shape variations. Everybody knows joy division, right? Oh, come on. Some of you must. This is from, I think, 79, Unknown Pleasures. That's the cover of their album. <laughs> this is the, uh, I think this is the original pulsar that Jocelyn Bell found, 1919 plus 21. Individual pulses. It's showing, and what you can see is that that pulse shape, while if you average it out, you'll have something that's approximately, you know, all the same, each individual pulse actually looks quite different. So the pulse variations are intrinsic to the pulsar. They're intrinsic to the emission region on the pulsar, and you cannot do anything about them. All you can do is average over them. So that messes up your analysis. It does. Yeah, it's, it's a pain. So you have to take long enough data sets that you can get a good average spec average uh, light curve. Um, so we're looking for this common correlated red noise signal in a data set that once you've corrected for all of that stuff should look like this. That's a nice pulsar. That's a pretty pulsar. 
And what will happen if that gravitational wave is moving past us is that well, this will move up and down. This thing will move up and down as that pulsar shifts closer and farther away from us with the gravitational wave. But what do you do with a pulsar that looks like this? Is this evidence of a gravitational wave? No, unfortunately it's not. This is caused by variations in that interstellar medium I was talking about. It's not, it's not, the, the galaxy is not smooth. Wouldn't it be nice if the galaxy was smooth? So you can end up with this, uh, the signature that we're looking for hiding behind other sources of noise. Here's an example. This is what I'm talking about right here. These are slices of time in a very sh small frequency band. If you look at that, these, these frequency bands are not very big. Uh, this is the largest one. Um, and that time goes this direction. And it's just showing you what the dispersion measure, that, that delay caused by the interstellar medium, what that value looks like at each frequency as you move through time. What you see here is the darker uh, parts are places where the pulse has been delayed more. The lighter parts are, pulses, are places where the pulse has been delayed yet less, even along this exact line right here. These are called scintillation patterns, and it's basically showing you the clumpiness of the interstellar medium between us and the pulsar on very small time scales. You'll notice that there's also different granularity to these different patterns. This is caused by distance. Closer pulsars will be passing through less material, and so the variation in the clumpiness will be less, uh, will be on a, just a smaller spatial scale, a smaller angular scale, I should say. Whereas, uh, yeah, this, this one is going through a lot more material, and so you have a lot more opportunity for different kinds of clumpiness. If that, if that makes sense. So those effects can't be completely mitigated. We can mitigate for a lot of things, but this one we can't. <clears throat> this is the data set for the 11 years. I'm almost done for it, guys. You can go out and look at this guy in a minute. But this is really cool. So we looked at the data set for the 11 years, and we're looking for a signal exactly like this. This is our 9-year data set for Manograph. This is our 11-year data set for Manograph. These are models... Uh, showing where it's possible you could, based on different models, where they expect to see a signal from the stochastic gravitational wave background. And we had this lovely peak sitting in the middle of Susana 2013. Great. Okay. This is evidence for a common red noise process at less than three sigma. So, okay. We still need to figure out if maybe there's some background effect. But <coughs> evidence for a common red noise process. That's our gravitational wave, right? because there's no other red noise processes that could possibly be affecting our data. <laughs> so we started looking. <clears throat> all right, let's try to break this. What can we do to break this? We tried all sorts of different things. Now, one of the things we tried was varying the solar system ephemeris. The ephemeris that's provided to us when we're doing this, uh, these data analysis is provided by JPL. And what we found with this particular one is that for a particular spectral index of the gravitational wave, we found that the limit that we were getting for the, the amplitude of that gravitational wave was different depending on which ephemeris we were using. That's not supposed to happen. That's not good. All right. <clears throat> so what's going on here? When we make these corrections to the pulse arrival time to do our analysis, we have to account for a lot of things. And one of them is the Earth going around the sun, Right? Because we're looking for Doppler shifts, essentially, except it's, yeah, it's gravitational wave Doppler shifts, but it's well, Doppler shifts. So if the Earth going around the sun will cause a Doppler shift, we've got to take that out. In fact, it's so sensitive that we have to take out the telescope revolving around the Earth. I mean, the Earth is small, but we still can see that Doppler shift happening. So that's got to be taken out. This is called very centering the data. Correcting to, with respect to the center of the solar system. So those corrections are made with respect to the center of mass of the solar system. Does anybody know where the center of mass of the solar system is? It's outside the sun. It's, yeah, it's just, a, just above the surface of the sun between the sun and Jupiter. And obviously it goes around as Jupiter goes around. We need to know that to within 10 meters to get our data. <laughs> Turns out that JPL does their ephemerides to 100 meters. So we compared the 
the ephemerides to see what was going on here. Basically, this is looking at version number 421, which is the one we started with, versus 430. What changed? 430 to 435. What changed? 435 to 436. What changed? And we looked at the signal. What, what was different in the ephemerides between these different versions? You know, there were details that were different, but you'll notice that there's this big, kind of this, in all of them, this, this wave, right, going this way. Turns out, that's due to Jupiter, the 11-year orbit of Jupiter. <clears throat> Anybody remember that number 11? This is the 11-year data set. Uh-oh. All right, so maybe we can solve this. We decided to refit the data accounting for the outer planets, basically folding the position, the movement of the outer planets, the mass of the outer planets into our analysis, making them free parameters and having our data tell us where the the planet was rather than JPL telling us where the planet was. And lo and behold, that peak, which is right here, and you can see that these are the upper limits and the upper limits were changing depending on which of those ephemerides we were using, that peak went away and all of these agree on a single upper limit. Unfortunately, that means that our detection of common red noise process went away, but that's good because we knew we found out that it was not the detection that we were looking for. We didn't do uh, a publication that we would have regretted later. <laughs> so now that we have an upper limit, it's not a detection, but it's an upper limit, it can still tell us something. We can compare those upper limits to the models that we think are what the universe does. And so that's what we did. Here, the, what you're looking at here, the orange, red, yellow uh, plot, uh, surface plot underneath here, is what the universe does if you have a lot, in this case, a lot of supermassive black holes and their black hole binaries and they're nearby. You get a signal that looks like this. Our upper limit is the dashed line here. We know that that, which was admittedly an optimistic model, it was designed to be an optimistic model, we know that it's not true. There are not that many supermassive black hole binaries in our local universe that we could easily detect. 2016, Simon et al. KH model, it's, it's kind of iffy. It's possible. We may be consistent with that model being correct, but it's getting to the point This dotted line is going to go this direction. It's getting to the point where we'll be able to rule that out soon if we haven't detected gravitational waves soon. For the other two, eh, we don't know yet. We're no longer, we're not yet at the point where we're going to be able to test those models. But we can firmly say that we are making astrophysical constraints, meaningful constraints, on how the galaxy merger history of the universe has played out. And over time, we expect to be able to start not just put meaningful constraints on it, but actually being able to make concrete statements about that as we get to the point where we're making detections or those upper limits have stopped dropping. So this is what we have to date, the detection limits to date. Um, Don't need to worry about this part. This is the nine-year paper. Our our upper limit for supermassive black hole binaries has gone down just a little bit, but it's comparable to the PPTA now. So it's about uh, 1 times 10 to the minus 15 is the amplitude limit for um, primordial black hole relics, which is another kind of source that can produce gravitational waves at these frequencies. We've put a limit on that with the 11-year data set of 3.4 times 10 to the minus 10 as a string. And for cosmic strings, Again, can also produce gravitational waves when they pinch off. Those, we have a limit of 5.3 times 10 to the minus 11 in the 11-year data set. And those analyses are in the process of getting published. Other pulsar timing arrays are now starting to include that solar system ephemeris in their analysis because of the work that this group has been doing and because of those discoveries that they've made. Last Last slide. So when do we expect to detect gravitational waves using pulsar timing arrays? Very good question. In 2016, Steve Taylor published this publication where he said, <coughs> he said, okay, let's make some basic assumptions. Let's do an optimistic and a pessimistic um, 
expectation of what might happen for these supermassive black hole binaries, whether they come down and, and merge quickly, which is your no stalling, or they come down and they never never get close enough together to make detectable gravitational waves, or very little. I mean, they'll always be making some. We're sitting right here right now because he published this in 2016. This is 2019. As you can see, <clears throat> the lack of a detection is consistent, fully consistent with our expectations. The uh, notice of the pulse, the percentage up there is only goes to 10%. And that's because of the way PPTA 4 was done. Um, so that's where we are right now. Now, the assumptions going into this were that the solar system ephemeris was okay, meaning we would not have to use some of the power of our data to solve for the planets. We now know that we do. JPL is not going to change their mind, no matter how much we ask them. They are not going to go from 100 meters precision to 10 meters precision. It's not going to happen. So we're going to have to do that work. So it might mean that these curves move out just a little bit, but not by a whole lot. <clears throat> It assumes that all the te telescopes that we're currently using for our data set, which right now are two, continue to operate. Uh, you may or may not know that Arecibo and Green Bank have both been listed for a uh, reduction of funding from the NSF. Keeping those running requires finding funding from the outside community. Finding fun funding from the outside community often means that the available time for studies like this gets reduced. So that's an assumption that we don't know if it's going to happen or not. And then finally, that we continue to add new pulsars to the arrays. This has been happening. It's been happening at prodigious clip. This assumed four pulsars a year added. During the year after this was completed, we added, I think, 11. So, so that's not a problem. That's happening. And it will actually improve the time on this a little bit. So where do we get, if we assume the pessimistic red line, where do we end up? If we want, say, an 80% of detecting gravitational waves. About 2026, halfway through-ish. I hope that's right. It would be great if that's right. That means we're moving along at a, at a good, good rate. Which means that long wavelength band gravitational wave science may be opening in the mid-2020s. That's before Lisa. That's before Lisa. So on behalf of Nanograv, University of Maryland, and NASA, I'd like to thank you for coming. We started our analyses using 4021, or 421, which was the first one that you saw um, in that, that comparison plot. Um, that was used for the nine-year data set. might have even been for the five-year data set. And then over time, JPL, as they send probes out to the outer planets, they learn more about them. Um, the reason that they did the 430, 435, 436 in such quick succession was because of Cassini. Cassini helped really nail down the mass of Saturn and the orbit of Saturn. And so they applied those corrections in, and that's what made some of the differences in the ephemer ephemerides. Mm -hmm. My question is a very, very simple question. When you were showing the photos of different galaxies with the black holes, was the left one down 51? Mm, I don't think so. Well, 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 I'm just I'd have to look it up. I don't think so. I, I made that graphic so long ago, I can't remember which ones I pulled. It was from the, the four-panel the four panel plot is a Hubble plot, so you should be able to find that somewhere, where they just did interacting galaxies, four of them. Over there. In the formation of the original uh, pulsar, the slow pulsar, separate yes. time scale, what causes the rotational axis and the emission axis, the magnetic field axis, to differ? It's actually not uncommon in the universe, if you think about it. The Earth's magnetic pole is offset from its rotational axis. So, so that is not an uncommon situation. What's really interesting is looking at some of these pulsars. Um, the, magnetic, the magnetic pole is what we're seeing as it rotates. If the magnetic pole were aligned with the rotational axis, you'd never see pulses. That's one thing. But it's amazing how many of these actually are orthogonal rotators, where you see the pulse from both poles. 
both magnetic poles as they go around. And the reason that we know that they're not, it's not just spinning twice as fast as we think is because the pulse shape is a little bit different for the two different magnetic poles. And so you can tell that one is one, that, that they're not the same location on the star. Is, is it common for the, pole, the two poles to be displaced that much? Because, I mean, when I think about magnetic and, and rotational poles of planets, mm -hmm. it's a handful of degrees or something. It's not 90 degrees. True. Um, it's yeah. it's a not not infrequent. I mean, we, we see a good fraction of them that have quite a bit of <coughs> offset. Wander in uh, time, generally. That's not, that's sorry? The poles wander in time. Right? They do wander in time a bit. The other thing is that they're not necessarily going directly through the rotational center of the star either. The Earth's magnetic uh, field is actually offset from the core as well. So and there's lots of different things that can affect it. Okay. Uh, in connection with that, the thing that produces the, the magnetic field, at least in the Earth's case, is basically a, a fluid turbulence. You know, the liquid outer core. Yeah. Yes. Now, once you get your mission out into space, how many years do you expect that to collect data on it before you start seeing uh, significant results? For LISA? Yeah. So LISA will have the best of both worlds. It will be looking for exactly what we're looking for here, um, that background of, of um, tight white dwarf binaries and tight neutron star binaries and tight black hole binaries that it are going to all be superposed and will eventually merge in the, least, in the LIGO band. Yeah. But it's also going to have the mergers from the, from the PTA band. So it'll get both background and mergers. Now that merger rate may not be a lot, um, it will kind of depend on when we detect uh, the stochastic background. We'll be able to predict what the merger rate is likely to be in LISA. But LISA's not going to be flying for as long as you might think. Um, the orbits of the three spacecraft, so, so the LISA spacecraft is a triangle, or LISA missions, triangle of three spacecraft that trail the Earth. If you think about it, if, if, these three spacecraft are going around the sun behind the Earth. You have different periods for the three different orbits, right? Oh, uh, and they'll end up dropping apart. So what they do is they actually have different inclinations, and the three spacecraft actually spin like this so that it maintains identical periods for the three spacecraft. You end up with a spiral <coughs> motion as it goes around the sun. Even so, we can get it pretty stable for a while, but there's going to be things that cause it to, to drift off. So, you know, five years, ten years if we can keep it station keeping, I don't think you're going to get much more than that. So we've got to get we got to get data fast. Will it be detecting the, the your ground based uh, detectors that are working so far? Will those events also show up in the LISA data? They'll show up in the LISA data before they show up in the ground based, because remember, there's a frequency shift over time. So as, the, as these two objects are spiraling around each other, as they get closer together, their periods get shorter, right? The frequency gets, sh the periods get smaller, the frequency gets small, uh, faster. And so they'll move from the LISA band until they move into the LIGO band and then they merge. It's pretty cool. LISA will be able to predict about a month out when a merger is going to happen in LIGO. Okay, so about a month out. Yeah. So it's not something that's going to take 20 years or something. No, no, no. no we'll we'll actually, for some, for some of them, we'll be able to, to predict it, you know. Uh, and farther out than that, I don't know that we'll have enough signal to be able to predict it. Because these are going to be small, tight binaries. So we might not get enough signal uh, with the larger, the larger arms at those frequencies. The uh, pulse from a pulsar is 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 that a whole lot of cycles of these different radio frequencies within that time time span of the pulse? The pulsar puts out a um, <coughs> it's a multi frequency thing. A multi frequency pulse uh, coming from emission of particles at the magnetic pole of the star. So you have a lot of charged particles being blasted off the magnetic pole 
What is what's so if the magnetic field varies as you go out from them, they're going to have different gy gyrating frequencies. Exactly. Yes. And that's going to give you a, a spread of frequency. Yes. Yes. And in fact, um, it's it's interesting that the millisecond pulsars seem to die at lower frequencies. It stop you stop seeing a pulse, being able to see a pulse at lower frequencies than the young pulsars. So. Apparently, the spin period has something to do with how much of that you get. So you were saying it was better to look at 400 megahertz as opposed to L band to see the millisecond. Right, right. If there are no further questions, let's thank our speaker again. Very nice graphics. Thank you.